Hi, Amy and Rob. Welcome, Amy, for the first time to the podcast. And welcome back again, Rob, to the World of Difference podcast today. That's good to Thank be back. You. Yeah. Yes, good to be here. Yeah, it's great to see you both together. It's great to see this book that you've written together and have recently released. Um, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. But first, um, why don't you each take turns? And Amy, you can go first, telling us a little bit about who you are, a little bit about your background. Um, and so Amy, you first, and then we'll listen to Rob. Yeah, so um, my name's Amy Dixon, and I am a children's book author. Um, I have uh, four picture books that I have written and are published, and I also have a middle grade novel, which was very fun to write. Um, so yeah, I also work in the publishing world, so I do some editorial work for Starry Forest Books. Um, which is also a children's publisher. And I have joined the marketing team at IVP Kids, which has been really fun. So I I get to do a lot of different things around, you know, on different sides of the desk <laughs> with books. And um, it's really a dream to be working in books. Awesome. All right. What about you, Rob? Yeah, married to a book expert, uh, for sure. So <laughs> yeah, we live in Central California. We've got four kids. Three are launched or launching out of the nest so everybody can pray for our fourth one who's stuck at home with mom and dad um for in terms of my vocational stuff i uh, work with intervarsity christian fellowship which is a college ministry organization and um, i do a couple of different roles with intervarsity but one of them is i function as a trainer consultant coach around issues of gender diversity in the ministry workplace. And so love uh, traveling around or Zooming around and helping organizations figure out better ways to operate as women and men in partnership together in ministry. And so that's kind of my passion. I also teach. So I teach at uh, Fuller Seminary in Pasadena and I teach at Fresno Pacific University here in my town. So, and then on occasion, I guess, I write picture books or help write picture, co-write picture books, we'll say, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, you're quite the duo. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Um, and I, uh, I know a lot of people have been really excited about this book. I have a lot of people on my social media feed that have been posting pictures with your book, Penny Preaches. And um, it, with all the things going on in the world, in faith communities and in politics and in societies at large, um, of all of those things, what inspired you particularly, each of you, and I'll let you go first, Amy, and maybe Rob, if you want to give your perspective as well, of what you were inspired by that led you to write this particular book? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> with this book, it's kind of funny because Rob had the idea of writing um, a book because he, this is kind of his area of expertise is this idea, idea of gender dynamics in the church. And he was kind of saying, you know, what if there was a book that we could make for kids when they're younger to start thinking about this issue, to really like start the conversation a little bit earlier. Um, and I think like for me, I grew up Catholic, so I never saw women doing any leadership, anything in the church at, at the time. And I went to 12 years of Catholic school. Girls were not even allowed to be altar people. Like it was all altar boys, no altar girls. Now they have altar girls too. Um, yeah, so it was kind of an interesting idea, but when he first asked me like, hey, you know, maybe we should do this together. I said, you know, I don't really have a vision for this. So I kind of like pushed it back to him and I said, you know, I'll be your editor. Why don't you like write a first draft and then I can like help you, you know, kind of work on it. And so he wrote a first draft and he sent it to me and I sent him some notes and I, I sent it back. and. He tried, you know, to kind of work on it a little bit. And then the second time it came back to me, I said, well, this is kind of what I had in mind. And I s proceeded to sort of rewrite it. <laughs> so then I sent it back to him and he said, oh, wow, this is so much better. Are you sure you don't want to write this together? And so then I said, OK, let, let's actually let's write it together. So that's sort of how this particular book um, started and i don't know rob you probably want to add something to that yeah, yeah well like for you yeah i think well when i started so i think i mentioned this a second ago laurie i spent a lot of time trying to help uh, institutions rethink how they operate around gender stuff so whether that's policy or theology or culture or structure or systems whatever 
Um, and that's a lot of work to change something that's been in place for so long in so many cases. Um, and so, yeah, when I, I had a little gap in my writing schedule and I thought to, naively, I thought to myself, how hard could it be to write a picture book? Right. I mean, I'm used <laughs> to writing like 60,000 word books and this is, uh, you know, I don't know how many words Penny is, not very many. Turns out it's really difficult to do that, right? But but I think the impetus for starting the process was trying to think about, you know, try to change stuff later on is challenging. What if we, like Amy said, what if we start earlier? And what if we start a conversation at the beginning? And what if we influence kids and families to think differently about how we do church regarding gender so that there's less work to do later on in terms of changing structures which are embedded so deeply in our institutions? So... That's kind of where, for me anyway, where it started. And then, like Amy said, the collaboration along the way has been just wonderful. And uh, it's brought us a lot of joy to work together on this. So awesome. I totally agree. And I think a lot of listeners would agree that so much of our bias or our prejudice gets formed in our childhood. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, representation does matter. Um, in the U.S., we are in a political season where, you know, there is a woman running for president. Uh, you know, only the second time we've had a woman in a major political party get that nomination. Um, and, you know, the fact that <laughs> I think it was um, somebody was talking about like that placemat that you have with mm -hmm. the presidents on it that sometimes people give their kids and it's, they're all men. And mm -hmm. so a little girl getting that placemat or a little boy getting that placemat, placemat is going to assume, well, U.S. presidents are men, mm -hmm. mainly because that's really the only faces they see. And that's the logical conclusion. So mm -hmm. it does from childhood onward, really just that representation really does matter. And so seeing that in a children's book, I would imagine, would really form hearts and minds in a particular direction. I'd love for you to so. share a little bit about the main character, Penny, and kind of what message you feel like she represents. Who wants to take that one? Mm -hmm. I mean, we can, do you want to start, Rob? Sure, I'll start. So, I mean, just to go off of what you're just saying, Lori, like it does, models make a huge difference. I mean, sometimes we've said it's hard to be what you can't see, you know? So if you, if you grew up your whole life without seeing a woman uh, up front, then you start to think that's just not possible. And so I think Penny's story in the narrative, in the, in the book, Penny is a little girl who decides she wants to become a preacher and um, goes through this internal, external kind of challenges. And then at the end, there's a model. She sees Pastor Sarah and it's, oh, wow, I guess I can do this. And I, so I think that value of representation and modeling is what we're trying to convey here. And then Penny herself is a model, right? So for kids, like, we've, like I said, we've got four kids and we want kids to read this and see themselves in Penny, or at least be encouraged to ask the question, what is God shaping how is god shaping me to be or how, how has god gifted me how has god wired me so at least to spark that conversation so yeah modeling at a couple different levels in the book we hope mm -hmm. yeah and i think just to add to that too you know it's i think a lot of times those leadership gifts that we can see in our kids even at really young ages a lot of times when they come out um in our female children, they're seen as negative attributes. So what we have one daughter in particular who had a lot of those leadership gifts. And as early as, you know, first, second grade, she's getting called bossy, you know, all of these things, all of these um, attributes that really are about leading and about leadership. Yeah, they had kind of a negative, a negative connotation at the time. So that was definitely something that I had in mind as we were kind of writing Penny is this idea that um, even as parents too, like we see things in our kids that we can help them, you know, try things, help them develop and help them shape um, those gifts into positive attributes. So yeah, that was definitely something that we had in mind. Yeah, hundred percent. So whether it's in, you know, a pro Protestant church, evangelical church or Catholic church, like what you're mentioning you grew up with or any really faith tradition, um, whether there's somebody who's listening, who's Jewish and they've had a woman rabbi and that's something maybe not all of their Jewish friends have been able to experience, then those things really do affect, uh, the way we view gifting, right? What are their God given gifts? And so, 
um, it is, it's, it's in all industries. I mean, it's in faith, mm -hmm. but it's also yep. in business. It's in education. It's in various areas. There are some female dominated industries like nursing, healthcare, for example, but you know, I know even doctors who are women or surgeons will have be wearing scrubs and they'll be the surgeon and they'll often yep. be assumed to be the nurse because there's just, that's the bias. That's the framework people have. And so it is an uphill battle a lot of times for these little girls. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to share even just a little bit more about this main character, Penny, um, and what you hope readers, especially some of the young ones, uh, will take away as they hold this book in their hands and they see the pictures and they hear the words, what are you hoping they kind of take into their bodies and their minds? I yeah. Penny. I mean, one of the things that, go ahead, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Rob. No, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that we talked a lot about is just this idea of like accessibility and being able to envision yourself like doing these things. So it's really about like opening up the landscape for, for girls to um, normalize, you know, mm -hmm. this idea of women being in leadership positions in the church, which, you know, depending on your faith background, like you said, you know, some people have seen that. It actually was interesting. There's a, a review that someone left of Penny Preaches and they said, this, this book is outdated. Like I have all kinds of women, you know, like preaching. And I was like, good for you. Like, that's amazing. I love to hear it, but that's, from my own experience and then, you know, from what people have shared with us, I don't know that that's the norm. But yeah, so just this idea of opening things up, making this accessible, making it, you know, available um, as an option for girls. Yeah. The other thing that I, I love, or one of, one of the other things I love about Penny is that she, she has this uh, earnest desire to hear from God. You know, and the, there's this openness to the things of God that I think is a good model for all of us. I mean, I think sometimes we think that the religious professionals are the ones that hear from God. But no, the truth is God speaks and we need to be able to listen to that even at an early age. And so I sort of love that idea of of Penny, even as young as she is, a believing that God will speak and then B, trusting that God has a word for her and then C, being willing to like take whatever she hears and run with it. Uh, I think it's a great, ex I hope it's a great example for kids and for parents um, in terms of how we, how we have expectations for our relationships with God and what that looks like to live out whatever we hear from God. So I love that aspect of Penny too. Mm, yeah. That she doesn't have to wait till she grows up to yeah. connect with God and, and hear from God. I hear over and over again in the faith tradition I grew up in, which largely, and I would say increasingly so over uh, the last part of my time with them before I left, um, which is the Southern Baptist Convention that I grew up in. Um, it did have women pastors and then it sort of didn't. So it went when it didn't go the direction a lot of us thought it would. But I over and over again heard stories of women who would tell me that when they were a little girl, probably around Penny's age, they really felt this calling to ministry, a calling to preach, a calling to pastor. And they really felt God impressed that upon them. And then again and again, when I heard the story, they would say they shared it with their often male pastor um, or even a Sunday school teacher who may have been a woman or even a parent. And over and over again, what they would be told is yeah. you have to marry a pastor and it would crush their soul, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Because it it did a lot of things. It um, it made them feel, well, maybe I didn't hear from God and I misunderstood that and then not trust themselves to hear from God or also just digesting the very sexist nature of how you would process that as a child, that only the boys get to do that. And how is it that I'm made in God's image and they are too, but that doesn't seem equal or right. And so have you encountered as this book has been released or have you thought about them as you've written this book. Um, Amy, I'll let you take that one first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I mean, it's been really wonderful to hear from people uh, about this book that, you know, we hear over and over, like I teared up when I read this book. It was healing for me to read this book. And a lot of that is, those stories are from women who at some point have felt a call on their life um, to lead and um, have had that questioned 
along the way. So while it's you know, great to know that this book is is striking a chord and people are connecting with it. It's also very sad because you were recognizing the amount of hurt that these women have experienced along the way in just trying to live into like who they are and who they felt they've been created to be um, and trying to be faithful in that. And they've just encountered block after block um, and a lot of discouragement. And so, um, yes, yes, we've heard a lot of that, like along the way, for sure. Yeah. A lot of people say stuff like, uh, we wish we'd had this book when we were growing up, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I'll say is uh, we were at a conference, Amy and I, uh, when Penny was just released. And one of the fun, encouraging things was watching a bunch of kind of grandma aged people buy copy after copy for their grandchildren, right? Because yeah. they'd been through this thing again and again and again for so long. And they just felt like, look, this is an opportunity to, to change the script uh, again from the beginning. Right. And so that, uh, I think we've got the grandma market cornered with Penny, the Penny preaches. So <laughs> fun to, pretty fun to think about that too. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I can only imagine what that would feel like as a grandma to finally get a book you wish you could have read and be able to yeah. give that to your grandkids. That must be really special for them. And, you know, not everybody is capable of writing a children's book or doing that whole process. And so um, it is such a gift for people who've longed for something like that. I know people listening to this, especially those in the audience who um, you know, have not had much interaction with Christianity, may be really surprised to even hear this concept that, you know, women are quote unquote, not allowed to preach or quote unquote, not allowed to pastor. Um, I know, I mean, you live in California, I do as well. And I, you know, I'll often be in conversations with people where I talk about the faith tradition I came out of was, is been fighting over whether women can be pastors in the very public news. It's like, yep. wow, like that's a thing in 2024. And so <laughs> maybe um, one of you could, take this on to describe um, why it's that way and maybe add your perspective to it. Like, how do you think we got here and what is it all about? I'm going to give that question to Rob, mostly because he, this is the center of his research. His doctoral work um, is one of the things I love about his work is that it's so it's like based in interviews and really conversations with women um, in the church. And so I'm just going to hand that off to him and let him talk about what he's. All right. Take yeah, it away, Rob. Right. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> yeah. pressure. no pressure or anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I mean, I think um, th this is 2000 years of church history that, that has flowed in one direction, right. And based on a reading of scripture that, and the practice of the church that enforced kind of male leadership at all levels, um, that's just that's been the way we've operated for as a church for 2000 years. And, you know, things change slowly. Um, institutions change slowly. And I think that theology and that practice are so entrenched in how the church does church that it's going to take a while to change that. Right. Um, I remember I was at a conference a while back and um, Ruth Haley Barton was up front speaking, uh, writer, thinker, pastor. And she said something like, I believe in 25 years, we won't have to be talking about this anymore because the church will have figured out that women have gifts and can lead and women and men are called to operate on equal footing. And I sat there listening to that thinking, I'm not sure I have the faith that the church can actually mm -hmm. change in 25 years. I mean, I'd like to, um, but it just feels like there's so much that needs to change. Again, it's the theology, it's the systems, it's the structures, it's the people, it's the, you know, the culture of the church. And so I think, um, you know, for me, Penny Preaches is just one more effort to do everything that Amy and I can do to, to try to be a positive force for change as we think about the church. I mean, we want the church to become a place where women can thrive, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, I just, again, the work, required to overcome that or to change that equation is going to be it's going to be a lot but i i think every little bit helps right so if penny can step into the void and say look this is one way to different way to think about this and we can start early thinking about this then go penny go i say right and then 
in collaboration with everything else we're doing on podcasts and writings and on and on to try to remake the church. I, I, um, it's all worth it, you know? So that's, uh, yeah, I mean, big picture. I think the answer to your question, Lori, is it's just entrenched in how embedded and how we do church, right? Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. even too, like Rob, a lot of the work he does is, you know, trying to help churches figure out how to become that. So it's like, they've, they've decided yeah. like, okay, we really need like to make sure that we're, we're doing this and we're living it out, but we don't know how, because they don't have models of places where, uh, this is where men and women are working in partnership and there's a thriving, growing church there. So a lot of that is they haven't seen it before. So it's, it's mm. hard to, do. again, Rob already said, it's hard to be what you can't see. So. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's interesting because there's so much in the church history that shows that women were leading all along, yep. you know, that it's a matter of our, our culture has changed and taken on traditions and looks back as if it was always this way, but it wasn't always this way. And even what we call preaching and pastoring wasn't what they call it, or they didn't even necessarily call it that. <laughs> and so therefore we're talking about apples and oranges. A lot of times, you know, I remember when I was in seminary um, with some of our mutual friends, Lisa Rodriguez Watson and Matt Watson, um, before they were married, we had a professor there, um, a theology professor that, you know, people would often ask him, what is his position on women pastoring? And he would say, if you can show me a pastor in the New Testament, then we'll have a conversation, mm -hmm. you know? And the reality is, is who are you calling pastor? Right. Who are they calling pastor? Mm -hmm. Pastoral gifts are gifts. Um, people preach the gospel like Mary Magdalene, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm um, teaching in a pulpit and calling that a pastor weren't necessarily how they did things. So throughout church history, you know, Dr. Beth Allison Barr, especially in her book, Making a Biblical Womanhood, and she was on the podcast when that released, you know, pointed out there are women all along that have been leading, That's even true. in the Middle Ages. We just didn't call it that. And so some people have this idea looking back that it's always been this way. Um, you come out of a Catholic tradition, but even after the Protestant Reformation and then even what the Eastern Orthodox Christians were doing, all very nuanced and different, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure you've encountered some of that too, that we have to be honest about the history and look back. At, I think one of the things Beth Nelson Barr said at one point was somebody asked her, why are you writing women into history when they didn't exist? She's like, but they did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not writing them in. They were there. You just didn't yeah. notice them. Yeah. So in your work, Rob, I guess specifically, are you noticing that even in egalitarian churches where they're saying women can pastor, are there still issues where they're not noticing the women or they're not giving them yeah. the credit or men are taking credit for the women's work, that kind of thing? Yeah, I like to talk about a, a gap. So they, so churches that say, yes, we are affirming of women. We want women to thrive. Women can lead. Um, I always talk about a gap between value and practice. So what we say we value is that women can do anything they want in the church, wherever God's gifted them, called them. But the actual practice tends to lag. And there's a gap between those two things. And so the question as a consultant I bring to the table is, well, what can we do to close that gap, right? What can we do to bridge the gap so that your practice better aligns with your value, the thing you say you believe, right? The thing that's on your website, the, the paper that's on the back of the church and the, on the table, right? Like, how can we better align those things? So, yeah, I see that a lot, actually. The, the good news, bad news is, like I've been saying, there are just such a range of things that we could do to close that gap. It's good news because there's something to work on always. Uh, the bad news is there's a lot to work on. So, so that's the good news and the bad news of that. But, but I'll encourage everyone listening, if you're in a church setting, ecclesial setting, um, yeah, what are the practical next steps you can take to better align the value and the practice, right? And what does that look like? Um, it doesn't have to be like a huge change. We all wanna make a huge change. That's the first thing we think of, but it can be like baby steps moving towards um, a different future, a different reality. So lots to say there, but yeah, the gap between the value and the practice is what I see a lot. It's confusing for women. Have you seen that to be true, Amy, where women assume this is an egalitarian space and they get in there and it doesn't feel all that different from the ones that say women can't pastor or preach? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah I, well, fortunately, Penny is a model for them. Yeah. 
this is what it looks like. Yeah, I, um, I'd love to hear your perspective, Amy. If you could think back on your childhood self, little Amy growing up in the Catholic church, <laughs> if somebody had handed you penny preaches, what do you think it would have done for you? How would you have perceived all of that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting because uh, while that was my faith background, I did grow up in a family that felt a little more like matriarchal in terms of like who was in charge. And then I'm I'm one of seven kids and five of us are girls. So it was a very like female dominated household and, and we were never really told that we couldn't do anything. But so it is kind of interesting to think about because um, it's like, wow, how did I like, how did I get to where I am today? You know, like having that kind of faith background and, and never seeing women. But I think it definitely was like a conversation in our household, because like I said, I went to 12 years of Catholic school. So I do know that there were conversations like, where, where are all the girls, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, why can't a girl be a priest or, or that sort of thing? And they would say, well, no, you, you can be a nun, <laughs> <laughs> which didn't, wasn't very appealing. I, I did, oh, no. was taught by nuns as well. Um, so yeah, like, I, I just don't recall too many people saying, you know, what I really want to do is be a priest. <laughs> it wasn't really a conversation yeah. growing up. So I don't even know where I, I lost the question and all of that. But yeah, I'm just, just wondering what you'd have thought if you got that book. If yeah, you know, would it have yeah. Blown your mind or yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit just because I, I hadn't seen a woman like in that, that area. But I do remember having the thought like, or even like with the altar girls, like why, why aren't there any, why aren't there any girls there? Yeah. Yeah, logical question. And, mm -hmm. you know, in our English translations of the Bible, so many of them, and I've been to these places like in, in the UK, I've been there, there's this church of the Holy Rood in Scotland that I visited a couple of times, which is where they have the King James Bible because King James was coronated there when he was 10 months old and Mary, his Queen of Scots was kept away and could never see him again. And I, it's a horrible situation that he was, you know, empire and religion mixed together of pol politics and religion in that way was very difficult, but it does appear that he had some mommy issues because of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And so in the English translation that a lot of people grew up with that speak English, they had this King James and it, a lot of his motivation was to keep people submitting to his authority. And so he chose these translators mm -hmm. to make sure they translated certain words into English in a way that kept his power. And he's this male, you know, king, head of the church, head of the nation, and you have all these male pronouns and it just feels very, very male. And I know many women, you know, English speaking that grew up with that, but even some of the more current translations that have chosen to still translate these words in a very male way. And it, it you ask the question, a lot of what you're thinking, Amy, is like, well, where are the girls? Like, where are the women? Yeah. <laughs> and they're there. Um, but so often they're not put into the language and intentionally so it seems that we've just inherited this thing that's a little bit recent. It's not a 2000 year thing, mm -hmm. but um, for English speakers, it's somewhat recent. So how do you process all of that, Rob, as you have yeah. been doing the work that you do? Yeah, well, I mean, Junia is a good story that sort of illustrates what you're talking about, Lori, right? Who is a woman from Romans 16, 7, prominent among the apostles, apostles, uh, and yet was written out of the Bible for many years because the thinking was that a woman couldn't possibly be an apostle. So I think that that's a good example of what you're talking about. I mean, I do think, I mean, you're totally right, right? Was, earlier I said 2000 years of church history needs to get rethought. It's true that women all the way through their exercised leadership and too often their stories were obscured. And, and I think and intentionally so written out of the story. And so it is about sort of going back and relearning those stories and bringing those stories forward and asking the question, what can we learn from them? And then it's about letting the energy from that flow into our present and saying, what can we do to, to not erase women from our current story and from our future stories as a church, right? So yeah, that process, again, a lot of work to do and a lot of intentionality, a lot of courage required, I think, to to reimagine church. Um, oftentimes I'll use a lot of verbs that start with R-E when I'm talking about the church in the context of how things work with gender. 
And the good news is there are people that are working on this, you know, and, and I think the community of folk that are wanting to see a different church is growing. Um, one of the things I've learned over the last couple of years is that if we can get people into the scripture, doing good Bible study, oftentimes they emerge from that process, at least being open to rethinking their theology around women and leadership. Um, I think a lot of folks have a theological perspective on women and leadership that they've picked up from the church they were a part of or the family they were a part of or a sermon someone preached a while back. But when you actually open the Bible and start to wrestle with the texts and look at the whole of scripture and not just a passage or two from the epistles, I think things change. And so, um, yeah, I have hope. Uh, I don't know if 25 years is the right number back to that story. I'm not sure, but but maybe lo a little bit longer than that. I, I have hope that the church will change in this area. We just have to be intentional about it and we have to have courage. Yeah, we do. It is interesting because um, there's so many conversations around how the church wants to impact society and um, there's the whole you know, worldly, if, if people who aren't maybe in evangelical culture or Christian culture may not even understand what the world word worldly means. It right. sounds like a good thing, but it's used as a negative thing <laughs> where the church wants to be separate and influencing the world somehow for the better. And when it comes to this issue, by and large, the church is very behind yes. and it has been behind on many things, enslaved peoples and, and other issues we could bring up in, in relation to that. But when it comes to people outside of the church looking in, people almost don't even have a concept yeah. that mm -hmm. women are not allowed to preach or allowed to be pastors as if men have to allow women to do that, as if God wouldn't be the one to say right. that. Like even people I encounter who don't believe in God can't even fathom Yep. believing in a God that you would say men have to be the ones to let women do this thing, <laughs> just yep. like speaking mm -hmm. for God. And um, yeah. How do you describe that to somebody who might be listening, who's never really had much encounter with Christianity and what you hope to see change? Maybe it's not 25 years, but in the near future yep. Yep. Um, in the church in this way. Well, I was just going to say our, our own kids don't understand yep. why this is an issue. Like it, it's funny. I mean, now they're, they're kind of in the college age group now, high school and college, but when they were younger, they were like, what, like, what does dad do? Like what? Like they just <laughs> didn't understand why it was a thing because both in our family culture and in the culture at large, women were always empowered to do whatever, you know, how, however God created them to be, they could be. So, um, but so it is kind of funny because I think in some, on some level it is like generational too. So, you know, kind of the, the younger generation coming up, it's very normal and natural for women to lead. Um, but yeah, again, depending, but go ahead, Rob, what were you going to say? Well, I think that's awesome. I mean, and it, it yeah. I think what you're describing, Amy, is a huge challenge for the church, uh, missiologically, mm -hmm. like meaning like, is the church going to be relevant for the yes. next generation that has this built in value for inclusion and for women and men working together, being friends, all those things. They don't, this younger generation doesn't have the same hangups that older generations might have had around this. And so I think it's a question and a challenge for the church to, are you going to receive this group, this whole generation of people that have a different way of thinking about gender stuff than the church does. And what's going to happen mm -hmm. as Gen Z folks come into our churches? I mean, I got, I got to admit, I'm a little pessimistic that the church is going to be able to receive them well. I mean, I know just back to our kids, our kids won't go to a church that women aren't, you know, free to lead in whatever capacity God's gifted them and called them to lead. It just won't happen. Mm -hmm. And they're not alone. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people in there a lot of uh, their friends. Me too. And, oh, yeah, right, well, yeah, sure. yeah, us two on this call. But I'm just saying for that Gen, <laughs> yeah. Z, that Gen Z crowd, that's a real yeah. value. So what are you yeah. going to do at church? What are you going to do? Yeah. yeah, this is the task. This is good. This is a make or break moment, I you know? So. And, um, yeah. and so um, some people say there's something salvageable here. Just be patient. Mm -hmm. I don't think patience is something you can yeah. ask for. I think you got to change this now. Yeah or people are going to move on and find something different. That's and right. I don't think it will be bad. I think people will find really good things and they'll start good things and we'll see little versions of 
reformations, whether they're radical or not, I think faith communities will form and morph and they'll look different. Yep. Um, cause what we have today isn't what you would recognize in the, you know, new Testament church either. Yeah, sure. And sure. so I think that, you know, there's an opportunity you can either yep. get with the program and make change or not. And so my hope is that they will, who knows, 25 years, we may have yep. a conversation and be like, we were surprised. <laughs> Let's circle back around in 25 years, Laurie. That sounds good. <laughs> That's right. We'll have you back on the podcast. We're still <laughs> podcasting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Thank you so much for both of you writing this very special book and getting it into the hands of grandkids and grandmas and everybody else and just inspiring people by Penny and her life and her hearing from God and, and preaching. And that and this is something that if little girls everywhere can understand um, and their brothers and their friends can understand that they'll be able to live out their God-given gifts throughout their life without anybody saying no, you got to marry a preacher, but no, you can do this. So thank you so much for writing this book. How can people find you and more of your writing and, and catch up with you? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, we both have websites. So I'm amydixonbooks.com. And then for social media, I am mostly on Instagram. So I do have accounts on the others, but Instagram is kind of my favorite place. So yeah, I'm at amydixonbooks there. Yep. And we should emphasize our website's very much in production. So if folks listening <laughs> okay. want to go there, just lower the bar of what you're thinking about. The website. <laughs> so mine's uh, Dr. Dr. Rob Dixon, drrobdixon.com. And I'm on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it these days. I think we should still call it Twitter. <laughs> but let's, uh, yeah, so Thank I'm you. at Rob F. Dixon on Twitter. And then folks can go to the InterVarsity Press website if they like and look up Penny Preaches, mm -hmm. and that's a good place to buy it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having us. Well, any last thoughts from either one of you of things you want to leave our audience with today before we finish? I would just say that just to emphasize that this book is not just for little girls, mm -hmm. that it is for girls and boys, because it is just as important, if not in some ways more important to normalize this for the boys in our lives growing up. So I just wanted to throw that out there too. Love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Amen. Well, thank you both for being on. And I'm going to ask you to hang out a little bit longer for our Patreon community to ask you another question there for our difference makers. But for this conversation, thank you so much. I hope this book gets into a lot of hands of boys and girls and men and women all around the world to inspire them of what could be um, and how God can speak to little girls and inspire them throughout their lives. Thank you both. Thanks, Laura. Thank you.